Okay. Welcome everyone to our second lecture on BC310 Church and Ministry Administration. We've been uh, discussing a little bit on handling difficult situations and um, just closed off uh, the last lecture by saying that it's important to address difficult situations, address the matter. Um, for the, especially for those of us in leadership, uh, we should not ignore the situation, we should address it um, as early as possible. Abraham, you have a question, please? Yes, sir. So please, in line with uh, what we are discussing right now, uh, one of our guests here in Vietnam had the opportunity to go to the US, but she got to the US uh, due to financial situations and financial problem, she happens to stay with her boyfriend now as we are speaking. So it has become an issue that we are trying to deal with. But we don't have that financial strength to, to support her back there. And now it's like the only option she has got is to stay with the boyfriend. So I think this was also, I mean, a problem to her. So she was looking for solutions. So she joined the church over there and went to the pastor to find out what she could do. But advice from the pastor's wife was, in America, this is how we live. If you leave the guy's house, you might lose the guy and all this stuff. So she also contacted me, letting me know the situation on ground. But here is the case that um, she's still part of us because she's been joining our meetings and she's still a leader. We still consider her as a leader knowing in her heart that she wants to do the right thing and if she has the money or there's an opportunity for her to move she will move but there is no financial resources now. so in our case what do we do do we allow her to maybe maybe give her some time to leave the guy's house or we should just terminate uh, her temporarily to maybe to say that she's not going to minister or she's not going to take part in the activities until she, she leaves the guy's house, so please, I will really know, I really want to know what to do from here. Thank you so much, Pastor. Mm. Yeah, I understand. <clears throat> it's a difficult situation. Now, um, so the, the two things here, one is obviously she is living in the house of her boyfriend or she's living in the same house and and to us that's a no no you know it should not be there should not be happening um but what really is wrong is if they were in you know intimate or in some physical relationship that's the wrong thing like if example example if uh, you know they were if they were two in example if there were there was a man and a woman they are just renting two rooms in this house living separately uh, okay you know we we won't say anything about it because uh, one is renting one part the other one is renting the other part or staying the other part and uh, we are not assuming any physical relationship between them right that's i'm just speaking in general terms so i think the most important thing is that there should be no physical relationship now that's very difficult obviously if you're living in the same place uh, and you know we don't know what's happening so there's a big question mark there but I'm just pointing out what is the real, what would be the real problem. Uh, the problem is not necessarily that they are renting two rooms or staying in two separate rooms. The problem is there should not be any physical relationship. And then obviously the second important thing is a testimony. You know, what kind of a testimony does this bear to everybody who would know her, especially if she has been in a place of leadership, so on. So. Um, the best thing, I, I know the, the big problem here is finances. So the best 
so so one is to check you know to make sure that morally they are right in the right place so it's not just about okay are you under the same roof are you living more are you living right before god morally right okay we understand okay temporarily you may need to live in this awkward situation of being under the same roof but morally are you right spiritually right before god so that needs to be you know you need to have an open conversation with her and say hey we understand the situation temporarily you're there but most important is are you right before god right so you need to check that out and just have an open conversation the second thing is as early as possible move to another place right now i would not agree with the advice given by uh the pastor whoever or whoever she spoke to the pastor or the pastor's wife i do not agree with that no we we need to maintain a good testimony so uh as early as possible god can provide right we need to ask god we need to look you know maybe she can find a home or, or even a temporary place where uh or you know there would be somebody willing to accommodate so i it, it is doable you need to uh look for it pray and then as soon as possible step out into a more honorable place honorable position so i think before you make a decision on whether to keep her as a leader or not you know the, the important thing is to have a open and honest conversation saying hey you've been a leader you know our you know what the word of god teaches you know what are the, what is the right thing to do where are you morally before god if there is compromise then yes you will have to relieve her of her position of leadership and also counselor or warner that you know that what whatever is going on is not right it's not acceptable before god and definitely it's not a good testimony if things are morally right the you know in any case the, the important thing is for her to move to a different place and believe god for that even though financially it's difficult god can still provide and okay make... yes we got it okay yes. yes pastor so another thing i wanted to add is i wanted to ask is is it possible that you observe somebody's spiritual life because of course we knew we know her very well and we knew how she started and we know how things are going on. so is it possible that we could observe her spiritual life and know whether she's living in sin or she's not living in sin or maybe she can be pretending and all those things is it possible to look from that angle or i have to probably go into asking questions and finding out i mean definitely you can observe but i think it's better to have an honest conversation you know because this is not something we need to we shouldn't be making assumptions so it's always good to just you know uh, two or three wherever the leaders are said you know have say hey uh, we just want to make sure morally things are right you know otherwise it's not not acceptable so it's good to have an open and honest conversation okay pastor thank you so much yeah roshan Pastor, I mean, uh, what if they are not honest when you're uh, when you have a discussion with them in regards to uh, you know personal matters or in regards to sin? So how do you tackle that? How do you know? Mm. So let's you know in the same scenario, uh, and, and and I'm not presupposing anything about this person. We don't know. I'm just using it as an example. So let's say you know the leaders here have a conversation with her and say you know hey. you know it's a very awkward situation but we understand that temporarily because of financial needs you're under the same roof but it's not right now most importantly are you living morally right before god there's no physical thing going on and you know you're living in separate rooms and so on and you're looking for a place to move out to you know it's so you're having an open and honest conversation if example there's only an example i'm not insinuating anything but if she is uh not true and she says yeah nothing is happening and you know, so on at the same time you need to look, you know as leaders you know the holy spirit is speaking to us right so you get a sense 
And then, then it's okay, this is what you have told us, but we are very concerned. Now, the reason I would use language like that is because of what I'm feeling in my spirit. Now, I don't want to immediately accuse, but I'm just saying, look, I'm very concerned. Uh, we don't feel right about this. We need you to move as soon as possible. And if you're not right before God, you need to get right. That means you're saying that, look, you've told us something, but it's still, you know, you're not feeling comfortable about with it. Of course, everything goes back to the individual, right? We can't force anything on a person. The, uh, they need to be honest before God. That's most important. So we put it back on them and then say, look, but this is what we need to see happen. We need to see you to move out as soon as possible. And until that time, is it okay that we um, don't have you in a place of leadership? Because it's affecting, the testimony is affecting, uh, you know, a, a lot of things. So I think even if they deny, or if they're dishonest, we are listening to the Holy Spirit. In a loving way, we are presenting to them what is the right thing to do, and we want to see that happen urgently. And uh, and we leave it there. And you know the thing is, God will work. You know, depending on where that person is before God, God will work things out. Thank you, Pastor. Um, all right, lots of questions here. <laughs> Elisha's question is: uh, Should church employees have their social media accounts monitored by the employer? So, I mean, uh, I, I, this is just my opinion is, uh, you know, everybody's free to do whatever they want with their social media accounts and so on. We don't monitor, uh, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't do it. Uh, I, I feel that if, you know, uh, we cannot monitor everything people do in their lives. That's not what we are called to do. And we should not be doing that. We are not, you know, we are not policing policing people. We are pastoring people. To pastor means we are, of course, we're overseeing them, but we are really imparting into their lives, teaching them how to live right, which will definitely show up in their own social media accounts. And uh, so, we don't, you know, we don't monitor their social media accounts. They're free to do whatever they want. But if something comes to our notice that's wrong. Um, we will definitely uh, alert them to it and you know have, uh, handle it. But uh, that, at, at least in our experience here at APC, that has not happened. But definitely, if there's something wrong, it should be addressed. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's move forward into the next few topics here on uh, church staff management. Um, Last few things. Um, usually, we conduct an exit interview. So, when somebody's leaving the organization, the HR person will talk to them, just ask them some basic questions about their experience, and if they have any feedback, they can. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that some of the things they say may be tainted by their, you know, by whatever they're going through. So, uh, we we do ask them questions, do ask them for the feedback about their experience, uh, but then uh, we, we we actually invite them to give it in writing. So we have a simple uh, document, right? And they give it to us on the last day at the time they're leaving. So that means they are completely free to say what they want and nothing is going to be held against them they are you know uh, free um but that's a that's a, that's a way to get feedback which can be sometimes helpful to make changes and so on um another last oh, another point is uh, you know uh, th there are labor laws of course in different parts of the world so whatever the labor laws are make sure that your christian organization is following those laws right so uh, you need to be aware of it and you need to be uh, following those laws uh, uh, by the given by the local government a few questions uh, that have come up in the past um, what can we do to help people grow within the organization? Um, so, uh, you know, provide training, provide opportunities, provide mentoring, uh, 
and basically help fulfill their vision. So even though people are working in the organization, they have a personal vision. They would like to grow, you know, in their calling, in the ministry, in their profession, in a certain way. So if you can help them fulfill their vision while they're also serving the vision of the organization, that'll be great. Uh, provide resources, uh, give them assignments, you know, opportunities, things to do. Also provide feedback. And the question, how do we separate the personal life of the church staff and their work at church? So this is a big, big, uh, let's say a big question, especially when it comes to church or Christian ministry. You know, how do we, how, just separating personal life and church work? Because all of this actually, especially in the context of church and Christian ministry, everything is just, you know, merged. Because who you are is where ministry is flowing from. And yet uh, you need, you know, you need this personal space. You need time with your family. You need time for yourself uh, where you're not doing church and ministry. So how do you keep that uh, distinction? You know, so uh, it's, because what you what we observe in many churches, many Christian organizations, this all of this is a big jumble. You know, everything is all together, and there is no separation. And 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 then what happens is the whole personal life gets swallowed up in church and ministry. There's not there's, they they no more have anything called personal life. Everything is absorbed into church and ministry. And then at some point, when they wake up they realize they've never lived a personal life or for, for, for a long time. They've never had anything personal. And sometimes the, the, uh, the, the pain, uh, the regret can be very, very painful. And, uh, you know, and, and, and people, you know, so it's, it's a very dangerous situation to come into that place. So it's important that we encourage other people to, know that they should have their own personal life, time for themselves, time for their family. And then, yeah, you are doing ministry, you are doing church work, but keep these things separate. Now, um, so how do we do that? One is we, uh, we try as a church, the way we work, we try not to disturb people outside of work hours. That means I try, for example, I myself, I will not call people after six o'clock in the evening for church-related things, for work-related, I will not call them. Or I will not call them before nine o'clock in the morning. So that means I'm respecting, like, okay, this is the work time between nine and six, that's when I should call, unless it's an emergency. You know, or for example, um, if somebody has passed away, somebody's in the hospital, then of course I need to call some of my, you know, somebody and say, hey, we need to go, so on and so forth. But otherwise, I don't. Right? I, I'm trying to be respectful of their time. And so what happens? Everybody starts doing that. So we don't disturb people outside the work house unless it's an emergency. Then for staff who are working Monday to Friday, we will not disturb them on Saturday and Sunday. There are some staff who will work Saturday and Sunday, you know, especially the pastors and others. Yeah, so then their work, their work happens on Saturday, Sundays. So we are respectful of that as well. When people are on, are taking the day off, when they are on leave, when they are sick, when away from office, when we will not call them, we will not disturb them. So these are things we practice as part of our culture, basically we are saying, we respect your personal life, we respect your time with your family, time away from church, away from ministry, we will not disturb. So then everybody understands that, you know, so that when somebody is on, away from the office, don't call them, try not to disturb them. Uh, so then it becomes part of our culture that we are respecting their personal life and we see it different from their time of work for church. So we don't disturb them in those matters. 
now there are so th that's that's you know how we try to balance this how do we separate personal life and church life and it's very important when it comes to church and christian ministry because like i was saying earlier if we are not careful everything just gets absorbed in ministry and that's that can be very painful very harmful for somebody's life and uh, personal life and family life and so on so we have to be very uh, uh, careful and I think if you build it part of the culture we'll talk about culture in, in another lesson but if, but if you make it part of the culture of your organization to respect people's personal time then everybody follows that everybody understands it. now um, some scenarios you know where it can work on the other way that means where personal life begins to impact church so I was talking about making sure church doesn't impact personal life so that's one side of it but there is a flip side to it where personal life begins to impact life on church because again like I said this can be very um, closely connected so what are some of the scenarios you know suppose somebody's working for the church but they have ministry outside that means uh, they may have their own ministry they may have sometimes business things happening outside you know they're, they're part of the church they're, they're doing their own thing outside now one of the things is we don't interfere in their personal time so what you do in your personal time is yours and you can do what you want but if that begins to affect what's happening in church then we raise a flag so example in you know if they start using their role as a pastor as a leader to uh, talk about their business talk about whatever they're doing outside or they use it to raise funds or to do promotions or you know if they're having a certain kind of ministry or work and there are other people in the church who are also having that similar type of ministry work uh, and then they're using their role in the church to compete with them that's not good you know and these are all real scenarios i'm not making it up these are things that have happened so then we have to be very careful so we uh, i usually talk to these people you know if, especially if they're working in church or holding some position in church and say hey you got to be very careful don't let what you are doing you know in business or whatever you're doing affect your role in the church sometimes uh, they have a poor testimony outside and then it affects what they're doing in church you know uh, so if the testimony outside outside the work is not good you know and people observing them uh, sometimes <laughs> i've got calls and messages and hey we saw so and so doing this and he's a church staff then you know hey so their testimony outside is affecting their role in the church and so i'll have to have conversation with them address that sometimes uh, family members start interfering with what they're doing in church you know so people don't regard the church as an organization they think it's like hey they you know they, it's just some casual thing you know so example the wife will call the husband to come home any time of the day you know hey no this working for a church is like working for an organization they're not just free to go any they have to work eight hours and so you know that kind of thing is happening and it's disrupting the work of the person in the church office then that matters also that's something that needs to be addressed or you know uh, if their wife is expecting the husband to be home or you're not allowing them to be travel to travel or to do you know whatever the work needs to do then that's a family constraint we have to address it and uh, very important no personal business dealings with church people so sometimes you know uh, i've had to address scenarios like this where somebody is has been given a role in the church you know sometimes even a pastoral role uh, they are doing their own business outside we don't interfere with that but then what has happened is they begin to engage with people in the congregation so we tell them very clearly you know see you if you have a pastoral role no business dealings with people in the church no but then it, they have violated that and then i've had to ask them to you know step down um, and of course there is this you know 
there's, there's been situations that I've tried to resolve and so on and so forth, but it becomes very messy because somebody's in a pastoral role, they're having their own business and they get into business dealings with people in the church, it affects their role as a pastor. And so, you know, it just becomes a very, very messy thing. And these are things that have happened. And uh, so we always tell them ahead of time, no doing that, you know, that's not acceptable. But then if they still go out and, you know, do those kinds of things, then that's where we have to address matters and take action. Last question uh, is, you know, how do you pass the church stuff? So again, here's another big challenge where, you know, people are working for the church. We are doing ministry, but, you know, it's work. It's, uh, it's professional work. And, uh, uh, and also maybe ministering to people. You know, you're ministering to people, you're doing professional work, it's work, you're giving your time, your energy, your skills, so on and so forth. And we also need to pastor them, that means take care of them spiritually. Because ultimately, uh, church is a spiritual ministry. Yes, it's a, we, we are organized in order to perform better, in order to serve people better. Uh, it's an organization from that perspective, but it is really a spiritual ministry. And so, uh, while these are staff, they are working, they're doing what they're assigned to do, they also need to be cared for spiritually. And so, um, this, and, and, and you know, the challenge is, when do you speak to somebody as a staff? And when do you speak to them as a pastor? It's a challenge because work matters, you have to talk to them as a staff, you know, you got to do this. But then there is a, they, they are also people who are part of the church, who are part of the, you know, the ministry, and you need to deal with them as sheep, as a shepherd would deal with the sheep, rather than as a, as a, employer would deal with the stuff. So when you do this, how do you balance the two? And for in the mind of the of the staff, they also need to distinguish the two. Okay, now this person is talking to me as a pastor. Now he's talking to me as an employer, right? Or as a what a manager or team leader, whatever. In their minds also they need to distinguish. They they can't say everything as purely staff or everything as purely pastoral. They can't mix the two. And yet as a leader you got to also take care of them as a shepherd, uh, not only as an employer, but as a shepherd. And both are there as a responsibility. So it makes this whole thing more challenging, more difficult. But how do you do it? And here are some things, you know, uh, uh, you make personal time to talk to them as a pastor, right? So I'm not talking to you about your performance. I'm not talking to you about your work. I'm not talking to you about your ministry. I'm talking to you about you. How are you doing? Uh, how is your family doing? Uh, how better are you spiritually? You know, so you have those casual conversations and you know that uh, they know that and you know that, that you're, you're just speaking to them as a pastor rather than as an employer. And you make opportunities for them to do ministry that will enhance them spiritually you know so this is not quote unquote work this is not something where your performance is going to be watched this is more of you growing as a believer right so you're creating those opportunities giving them those opportunities uh, you know um, one of the things we encourage people to do is go on mission trips so we've just started our mission trips um, that is going to different parts of our country ministering, you know, just um, last weekend. Yeah, I think Pratik was on that trip. People, one of our staff was also on the trip. And then this week, uh, Nancy and Deepika are traveling. They're ministering uh, at one of our outreach churches. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we encourage all, all our staff. They get one paid mission trip a year. That means the church will pay for them, and they can go and uh, do the you know minister and come back. So it's an investment into their spiritual life, their development, uh, and so on. And then, of course, whenever they need, there is counseling available. They can either meet with any any of our pastors or counselors and so on. So this is another area of challenge, but I think 
if we are consciously actively doing both that is being an employer and a shepherd in doing both then we can balance the two that is uh, there is performance but there is pastoral care as well right so let me stop here pause for a moment um, uh, okay let's take up some questions before we go to the next chapter um, Elisha must all church staff be believers Christ believers the answer is yes all our church staff are believers uh, so that we can all flow together uh, you know with the same vision understanding mission now we have vendors who are of course not believers I mean vendors means you know, these are people who will provide certain service or things for example you know uh, we rent out certain things every Sunday like our uh, LED panels that are put up in the ch church in the auditorium a um, couple of things that you know things that happen in you know in the Sunday service for the, those who those are vendors they just come and provide that service so of course they are not they don't have to be believers and in most cases they are not believers they are they come and just do their part and go but church staff yes all are believers in fact we we make sure they're aligned to who we are as a church our statement of faith uh, they're aligned to you know where we're going that they're really you know uh, committed to jesus christ before we engage them abraham um how about those who are volunteering to serve? How do we deal with them? Yeah, so that's our next lesson, Abraham. We have a complete lesson on working with volunteers, uh, and that's a big area. Uh, so we're going to spend uh, a few lectures on that and volunteers, and then how do church staff relate to volunteers? That's also a big thing, a big dynamic to balance because you know we you need to take care of both. You need to take care of your staff, but you also need to take care of the volunteers. Volunteers are very valuable. Uh, and sometimes uh, difficulties happen between staff and volunteers you know and so you have to manage that so that's a very big area and uh, we will talk about that in the next lesson Shri Kumar you have a question please yes sir thank you uh, sir I want to know uh, that as you said um, the, uh, that how the pastor who is involved in the business um, should not engage the church uh, you know into his business so i just want to know in 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 this scenario where the member of the church is a partner of pastor's business so in that case how we will be able to handle the thing mm. so I just want to know thank you yeah so this is only a a, a guideline so you know like what i said uh, when i said you know somebody who's in a pastoral leadership role shouldn't get into any business dealings with people in the church that meant uh, I don't mean that uh, you know uh, they shouldn't be employed uh, I see there are different scenarios for example when I was running my software business quite a few people who were working in the business working for me were also part of the church yeah so they were uh, employees of my of the company the software company and they were members of the church and serving the church so uh, but then everything was clear they are not treated preferentially in the church just because they are part of the business they're not everything's clear so that is okay you know but what I meant is no getting into any financial arrangement with people or engage in financial dealings so I never for example you know one lady came from the church and said I want to invest money in your company I said no thank you no well you know because that's a very dangerous situation so no we are not to do any of that business is separate church is separate uh, so in a situation where a pastor has somebody from the congregation as a business is running a business somebody in pastoral position running a business and he's got somebody in the congregation as a member or a partner in the business it's so important to manage that properly that means the pastor should not give any preferential treatment to that person in the church in the church everybody's equal everybody's safe now for whatever reason you know the pastor may have had may have that person as a partner in his business 
as long as if it's managed properly, it's okay. Otherwise, what will happen is, if something goes wrong in the business, and this has happened so many times, that person is going to badmouth the pastor. He's going to speak to so many people, oh, pastor did like this, did like that. And, you know, if, if something goes wrong in the business, I'm saying, he's a partner within the business, something goes wrong, that person is going to create problems in the church. He's going to badmouth the pastor, he's going to, you know, just ruin a lot of things. So that's, and I, you know, so it has to be managed very carefully. So that's why I say it's better not to get into such kind of an arrangement. And I, I stayed completely out of it. There were a lot of people who would want to do that kind of thing with, with, with the pastor, but I said, no. The only thing we did was when I was running the business was, okay, if somebody needs a job and they will come and work, you know, if they qualify, they can, okay, yeah. Uh, they, some were working like that and they're very good people. But they were not treated preferentially in any way in the church. You know, they nothing. Uh, yeah. So examples would be, you know, when when there's money hap money transactions happen, you know, transactions happening, money, which whether things happen, you know, then things go sour. It, it was, you know, a very messy situation, very messy, because one family was affected because they had given money to the pastor to make certain invest I mean I'm talking about the person who was in a pastoral position uh, they'd given money to that person to do certain investments and that messed messed it up and so now it is affecting the entire dynamic from the, that family with the pastoral team you know it's they, they were dealing with one person but then that person was part of the pastoral team so I had to address it say no you know these kind of things are not allowed uh, you know, uh, another situation was when there was conflict between people running similar businesses, you know, uh, just because out of a sense of competition, you know, and it's so messy because one of them is <laughs> part of the pastoral team, another person is a member of the congregation, they are running similar businesses, now they're in competition, and it's become a kind of a verbal conflict, it's very messy, said no cannot handle these we will not tolerate these things you know so so that's why i always say you know, no business dealings with people in the congregation at all yeah thank you thanks a lot all right let me uh just christopher go ahead so uh, thank you pastor i just wanted to find out uh, from the point of view of uh, uh how the church um, would uh, deal with um, people in the congregation uh, who may be um, who may have fallen into sin, and um, in one case it is it is it is confidential, um, and, the, and in the other case it is uh, you know it is well known among the congregation that they are living in sin, so it can be different types of sin. Um, so, will churches? Um, uh, will church will will a church need to be able to you know go through the process of counseling and you know and trying to uh, uh, you know have that the, the, the you know those people um, work through that and you know overcome overcome that sin uh, or could there be situations where uh, it could be more drastic and you know they may need need to ask the, the those people to to actually leave the church. Just wanted to find out if there is uh, any sort of scenarios that would um, that would uh, require that kind of action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first part, definitely, you know, if they are part of the church and uh, you know this thing surfaces where you know there's they're living in sin, definitely that we get involved, uh, or the pastor of that location will get involved to talk to people, and then it might, you know, I might also get involved, and we have, we have. And um, we would try to address the matter, you know, counsel the people, and uh, and so there have been, you know, I would say a handful of situations in the last twenty years or so where we've had to deal with that, those kinds of matters, and uh, we've got involved, we've tried to address it, and and uh, in some cases, especially when I'm talking about husband-wife situations, things have been resolved and the marriages are strong today. 
everything is fine. Uh, some cases, uh, if especially if people are not willing to receive counsel, they're not willing to make change, the problem just continues. You know, and sometimes we see, or we have seen repeated occurrences, especially like, you know, of unfaithfulness and so on. Sir, you are muted. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so we do get involved and we do address the matter. And, uh, you know, like I said, in some situations, things have worked out fine. Problem solved. Marriages are safe today and people are fine. In some cases, um, it's still ongoing. You know, and because one of them is not willing to change. Now, um, about telling people to leave the church, that's something we would do. Uh, the Bible teaches us concerning that. Uh, and I'm just thinking of First Corinthians chapter 5, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 5 as references where such kind of a disciplinary action uh, in the local church context is uh, uh, instructed. Um, in these, um, at least here while pastoring at APC, um, I can think of right now, I have to think of right now, one situation where I've had to personally tell somebody not to come to church. Now, see, usually what happens is when you address a problem, sometimes people themselves leave the church. And that's that's a typical response. And I've seen it happen several times where there is a problem, we address it. You know, of course, everything is done privately, so nothing is done publicly. So I, you know, I might meet with them. I would meet with them and I say, hey, what you did was wrong. This is the correct action to take. And instead of repenting and taking that action, they would just leave the church. You know. So that's happened uh, a few times. That means they're not willing to take the corrective action. They want to choose their own way, whatever, so on. And I can remember only once when they, I've had to tell somebody to not come to church. And this was more of, or I, I would say like, yeah, once. And one in one case, they just left the church. And this was more of a kind of a, I don't know what to say, maybe like a theological disagreement. Uh, so it was kind of funny because many years ago, I was doing a series, I was doing a sermon series of question answers and, you know, we were taking questions from the congregation. I was providing answers, and this particular person, uh, you know, he he disagreed with an answer that I gave. Now, of course, I'm, I'm not expecting everybody to agree with me on everything, but this person disagreed, and then he called on the phone, and he was very, very, you know, it, the, it very heated on the phone. Then I just said, "Hey, if you're not happy, please leave the church." You know. Nobody's forcing anyone to stay in the church. If you, you know, if if my response, biblical response to a particular question, uh, you didn't agree with it. I mean, we can disagree and still be friends. But if this disagreement is so grievous, you're free to leave the church. You know, please leave the church. Don't have to come back. And so he left the church. And very interestingly, his wife and children came back to the church. Some, I mean, some, I would say, sometime recently. And they started. They came back. They were attending APC. So, uh, or I would say, his wife and uh, one of his children. The other person, I think, is overseas, or I'm not sure what happened. But they came back. They were attending APC. And we welcomed them. I love them. Welcome them. Hey, you're welcome back. But I, I can remember that situation. In other situations when people don't agree theologically, they just 
again just like how when we correct somebody they also just leave uh, they may not you know agree with something okay? they don't believe in speaking in tongues or they don't believe in the uh, if you don't force people they just uh, you know leave and that's fine they made their choice decision yeah I hope I answered your question no. okay um, all right, so we've kind of we're going to close up this lesson on church staff management. It's a it's a big area. It's a very important area. Uh, our next lesson is on volunteer management, which also is a very important area in managing volunteers. Right, so we're going to spend some time on that. Now, next week, Thursday, uh, I'm actually traveling. Uh, we're doing. A a pastor's conference uh, somewhere near Mumbai, so I'm traveling. So uh, most likely I may have to, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can do my 9 to 10 class before I go to the conference. Uh, I'm just going to see if it's possible. just depends on the situation. Uh, uh, otherwise, I, I may miss both my classes next Thursday. Uh, I'll, I'll try to see if I can do my 9 to 10 class. Uh, but then... Um, yeah, um, so we're going to be near Kalyan. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, so we're going to be near Kalyan. So um, it's about an hour and a half, two hours from Mumbai, I think, somewhere there. So they're yeah, having that. So uh, I will probably miss both my classes, but I'll try to see if I can do my nine to 10 before I go into the conference. Um, but then the rest of the classes we will take the week after. All right, uh, we've got a lot of important ground to cover and we will do that. Okay, could somebody um, uh, close in prayer and uh, we will dismiss, please. Anyone? Sir, can I pray? Go ahead, Sri Kumar. Thank you, sir. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day which you have given to us, Sir God. Father, we surrender everything before you and we pray that, Father God, every word what we receive today, Lord Master, we pray that, Father, give us grace, Lord Master, let it all deeply rooted in us. Let it let be able to preserve in our heart, of Father God. Let it increase our wisdom and knowledge of Father God so that we can able to move ahead, O oh Father God, with this, with this understanding, with this knowledge, with this revelation. O oh Lord Master, thank you for removing our ignorance, Father God, through your through your word of God. Thank you once again for strengthening your servant of God. And also, Lord, as he's traveling for the ministry, Lord Master, bless him and use him mightily, Lord Master. And and to him, Lord Master, many lives be touched and blessed, O oh Father. Thank you, for Father God, for all the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Man, thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon again. Thank you. Bye now.